start again. For those of you that have your bayonets facing outward like that, I highly encourage you when you get your own to face, to turn them in. I find it a little less cumbersome, easier to draw. I've seen both, but I think it's easier and less likely to pop them. Rolling it on their lap. And then they tied it, they figured out a way to tie it to maybe a stick or a rock. Yeah. And do what's called drop spinning. Okay. Um, they didn't have this machine. Right. Um, they had a drop spindle. Mm -hmm. Did they want to use in more? If you, you yeah. pull your hair, one string, one strand of hair is weak, yeah. more is stronger. Sure. And so they twisted it to have strength in their the things they were tying. To tie their clothes on, to tie their shoes on, to tie their the cavemen, traps. Did they have, I guess they just had like pieces of animal growing. We carry rifles, so we do the same raid screens in linear, but we cannot defend ourselves without a bayonet. So the, the rangers carry a musket and bayonet, so that, that interoperability of professional soldiers worked. You know, we were brought over to counter the American rifle, but in their engagements, they did not have the interoperability that, that was required with their own line, and so they were used as an isolated or separate specialty force, but didn't have the integration in the mix that they, they required to fight. <laughs> yeah, we um, saw the show turn. Yeah. Oh, uh, we're oh, like uh, big Simcoe fans now. Oh, well, <laughs> see, and that's sad because that, I mean, he was not that way. That he wasn't. Oh, not the way they're depicting him. At the, like, a, like a psycho. No, actually, he was a very professional and honorable uh, officer. In fact, I, when I first started watching it and I stopped, I said, because if I was the don't relatives don't of the ancestors, I would, <laughs> I would be very upset that they portrayed him in that so ill of a light. Because yeah. he was a very professional officer so, yeah. um, and, and continued on in his career. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is a... a a very misrepresentation. Yeah, it's a bad. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, but military prowess he did have, and and, and, and again it was well recognized. It's just unfortunate the character base that they do there is a little more Hollywood than fact. Gotcha. That's why the final episode. I, you watched the whole thing. The final yeah. episode. He makes that huge like character change where all of a sudden he's a good guy. That's why that yeah. seems so weird. He oh. he was actually one the whole time. You know, yeah. as soon as he gets right. to Canada, he and liberates injured. every single slave. Yeah, in yeah, the right. whole colony, yeah. and right. that's true. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. 100 percent true. In right. fact, they still have Canadians. If you ever meet one and ask them that, they have a hall. So some were actually torched and some were scuttled. It had to be more than five. Now that I think mm -hmm. about it, mm -hmm. but um, the entire little navy that we had was was lost. And then so, he goes up to Richmond. Uh, Arnold rejoins Phillips. And they march up to Richmond. But here's one I bet you don't know. I bet you don't know this one. But <laughs> if you do, I'll be thoroughly impressed. What was the name of the French general? Who, he actually, he wasn't, he's French, but he's not in the French army. He joined the American army and he was sent down here to help us out. Yeah, I think he knows it. He's got a smile. I think he does too. And he was young, very young. A very young man. Yes, and he very actually young. angered his king by coming over here as a volunteer, but he thought what we were doing was neat. And so he came and then was put in charge. You know it? He was a Frenchman. Very friendly with George Washington. Oh, yeah. yeah. Very close. Like his son. Mm -hmm. You probably heard his name. Too. All right, I'm going to give yeah, you a clue. Sure he has. I'm going to give you a clue. Down south from here in North Carolina, there is a town. You ready for this? <laughs> or city or called Fayetteville. Fayetteville. And it's named after this guy. It's connected to this guy. His last name was Lafayette. Huzzah! Yeah, exactly. Very good. Well said, sir. sir. You got it. Yeah, Lafayette I knew it was, was on good. the tip of your tongue. Yeah, I can see it. See those wheels turning. Do you know how old he was when he came here to fight and yeah. lead the troops? 19 years yeah. old. Yeah. 19. 19 years old. And, and his first battle was up north of Pennsylvania. He gets shot right in the leg. He wasn't even in command of anything. He was just kind of there as an observer. And he gets shot. Now, luckily, it didn't hit a bone. So it was just a little mark, a little scar. But um, he was one of these guys that um, would do whatever was needed, and, and General Washington appreciated that. So he rose up to the ranks pretty fast. And I think by the time he's here, it's tw he's 23. Yeah. Because that was 77. Yes. Yeah. So 23 years old. Brigadier General. 
say the cavalry comes right cavalry is infantry in this period and that's going to be what we just talked about so when you see our um us kind of like roughly dressed folks today kind of like this that's pretty much what the militia looked like um and remember ages 16 to 50 is the age and it changes sometimes 18 to 45 yada 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 but you had people in the field who were mostly men but not all men Every once in a while, a woman disguises herself as a man to serve, which happened. Um, but women are going to get in the fight in other places, right? Not officially in the militia, because you're not allowed to be in the militia. So where would you be in a fight in the war? You, well, you, you'd help in those capacities, right? Um, but there are places that are on the western edge of Virginia, uh, where the British agents have sent in um, Indian parties to come after the civilian population. It will be there that the women will be under arms in houses, uh, at times holding off Indian raids. So it touches everybody. Um, so anyway, I don't want to keep you too long. Uh, we're actually going to go back to cooking, which is a principal activity of the militia. Um, but keep in mind too that the militia in this war in Virginia at this point, you see these tents? We put that up. I don't know, I guess for the best case scenario, like if we had tents, four of us would be in one of those. Canvas is expensive, especially linen canvas, hemp canvas, very expensive, period, um, because it's a war commodity. So the militia is the last to get those things. So if we had a tent, being that I'm carrying the sash and I have a sword, I'm one of the officer subalterns of the company, who gets the tents first? The officers. And the men sleep? On the ground. Right. So the men actually, in this campaign, most of the militia are documented sleeping what they call two words. I'll give them to you both. Wigwams and brush houses. What are we talking about? <laughs> That's right. They see you go into the woods, you find some cedar, you find some holly, whatever you can get branches from, and you start building a teepee and you lay those things on there, and uh, you live in it. How effective was that to sleep in, do you think, when it's raining out? You, yeah, exactly. And then, I think Corey will mention this in his uh, music program, but the Virginia militia at one point in this campaign are being directed in camp, not by fife and drum, 
but by a conch shell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, like Lord of the Flies, yeah. Piggy in the Conch. Yeah. <laughs> and I saw this because in the Virginia Historical Society, there's a, there's letters of Colonel uh, Parker, who commanded the militia. In his order book, he says, "I need my officers to come to headquarters so that we can teach them the calls of the Conch." And I and I scratched my head and I went, "What?" It took me a minute to go, "Oh, a conch shell." So can you imagine? There's militia up and down the James River. Waking up every morning to. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so so music is always, but we do know that the in the regulations the militia has to fight the drum, but again it's a pecking order. So if there's not many fifers and drummers, they go to where? Certain places. Where do you think the fifers and drummers get pulled to? The militia or the Continental Army? That's right. So, probably there would be fifers and drummers with the genitals. <laughs> and under that, you're back to the conch. Such as it is in the militia. Anyway, go see everything. My name's John. If you have any more questions, feel free to ask, all right? On that, if you're trying to be a farmer and you're called to duty seven times, uh, yeah. how much work do you get done, right? Not much. So, what you're going to... Yeah. Times is that... Um, a lot of the militias that are in Virginia are wearing their civilian clothes and to distinguish them as soldiers, they wear these hunting shirts. So other than that, I'm wearing my work trousers, my civilian clothes. Otherwise, you wouldn't know, if I was in the field, you wouldn't know I was a soldier. Yep. Um, the Continental Army is slightly different. The Continental Army has regular uniforms, um, which are more discernible. So the... Um, if you saw me wearing these work trousers in the Continental Army, you'd probably say I was out of uniform. So in the militia, you just you wear what you turn out with. And the only way that you're going to know I'm a slightly different one of them is by the sash that I'm hiding under me right now. Do you see it? The cord. Right, right. Yeah. All right, so the reason why I'm hiding that is because they are marksmen in General Arnold's Army. And if they... If they see your sash and know you're an officer, you might come under more fire than you really want to. So that's one of those things. Otherwise, there's no badge of authority on me that you would discern as a, an officer. But I'm scared on the battlefield being singled out by a marksman. Yeah, this is one of the first wars in history with firearms where um, officers will be selected out. It was considered ungentlemanly to kill the officers. And do you know why? No. <laughs> it's a social thing, right? Oh, it's, yeah. It's, okay. If you don't have the gentleman controlling the non gentlemen Okay. And those non gentlemen uh, are left to their own vices, um, atrocities could happen on battlefields to civilian populations. So the idea is that the control of those human beings is the officer class. So you don't kill the officer. Yeah. Thank you well, for that. I sure. didn't know that.